welcome to the Turkey Hunter Podcast with me, your host, Andy Galliano. In this podcast, I share with turkey hunters just like you how to have more turkeys on your hunting property and how to have more successful turkey hunts. I teach you how to do this with tips and interviews with turkey hunting pros, wildlife management tips, and entertaining turkey hunting stories. Tune in weekly as I share proven and simple strategies to help you have more success this turkey season. Make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe to receive free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews. Also, please visit and like my Facebook fan page. Go to Facebook and search I Am Turkey Hunting. And also feel free to post your turkey hunting photos from this past season and let us know where and when you killed your bird. For all of you Twitter users out there, please follow me on Twitter, where my handle is at turkeyhitman, and I will be sure to follow you back. And now, for this week's show. Hello and welcome back to this week's episode of the Turkey Hunter Podcast. You are listening to episode 120. Advanced Trap Sets for Wild Turkey Predators with Trent Masterson. And I am your host and probably one of the few human beings on the face of the earth who gets a little excited about deer season coming to an end. Which it will do in my neck of the woods on February the 10th. Part of the reason that I get a little excited about it is because February is always a jam-packed month with the NWTF convention coming up, with the local NWTF banquet coming up, and with turkey season right around the corner. Speaking of that, we are 34 days, 9 hours, 19 minutes, and 4 seconds away from opening day of spring turkey season in Alabama. I'm going to say it one more time because it just sounds so good. It just rolls off my tongue 34 days it may sound like i'm rubbing it in a little bit for you guys who have a season that doesn't start until middle of april or first of may but trust me i know what goes around comes around and when you're still hunting may 1st or you're starting to hunt may 1st and i am done i'll have my bottom lip poked out so I'm not really rubbing it in. I'm just really excited about it. So listen, before I get started with today's show, I want to thank you guys again this week because, you know, I set goals for pretty much everything that I do. And my goal for the number of downloads for this show for this spring looks like it's going to be met this month. I was thinking, hoping, praying that we would achieve that goal in April, which is always the month with the most downloads. But here we are, two months ahead of that month. It looks like we're on track to reach my goal. So thank you guys. I just can't tell you how much I appreciate you listening to the show, how much I appreciate you forwarding the show to your hunting buddies, and also forwarding on social media. What you do has really helped to grow this show, and I I just can't say it enough. So Listen, Cameron and I have a heck of a show for you guys today, as I'm going to be talking with Trent Masterson with the National Trappers Association. Now, actually, Trent's wife is a convention coordinator for the National Trappers Association, but Trent is very involved with the NTA, and he's been trapping nearly his entire life. In addition to that, Trent's been turkey hunting about that long as well. He's a great resource when it comes to trapping and turkey hunting. So I met Trent and his wife Tammy at the NWTF convention in Nashville about three years ago, and I invited him to come on the show later that year and to talk trapping wild turkey predators with us. Now you can find that interview on episode six. So if you want to go back and listen to one, that's one that I definitely recommend going back and listening to. So this past spring, I actually had Trent and Tammy come to Alabama to turkey hunt with me. And even though we had a pretty rough go at the turkey hunting and the birds didn't cooperate, in fact, we didn't even hear a turkey gobble the whole time we were there, I thoroughly enjoyed my time in the woods with both of them. We had a lot of fun and we talked a lot about hunting and trapping. 
And those conversations really got me thinking that I need to get Trent back on the show to talk to us about some more advanced trap sets for wild turkey predators. And that's exactly what I did. So Trent and I actually spent over two hours on the phone talking about trapping and predators, and I really got to pick his brain a good deal on the call. Once I got him talking about trapping, he was in. Couldn't slow him down, and I was not about to. And now, because this interview with Trent is so long, I'm actually going to break this interview into two parts. Part one of the interview is just seconds away from starting, so listen closely to Trent Masterson, and I'll see you guys on the other side. Hey everybody, I've got on the line with me this evening Trent Masterson, and Trent is with National Trappers Association. And Trent, well really Trent's much, much better half is the convention coordinator with the National Trappers <laughs> Association, but that's how I met Trent. And so I wanted, well, I actually had Trent on the show, wow, it was way back in one of the early episodes, and I'll have to look up the episode number. So if you guys have not listened to that episode about trapping wild turkey predators with Trent Masterson, then I'll, I'll tell you the name of that or the number of that episode here shortly. But Trent really opened my eyes about trapping predators. and. Mm-hmm. Even when, well, and I'll, I'll say this, at the last NWTF convention, I invited mm-hmm. Trent and his wife, Tammy, to come to Birmingham and turkey hunt with me. And so when Trent and Tammy were here, and they were turkey hunting, we got to talking a good bit more about trapping and mm-hmm. talking about how much of an effect it has on wild turkey populations. And it's not just turkeys, it's all of the critters we like to hunt. It's quail, it's pheasants, it's chuckers, mm-hmm. it's white-tailed deer, it's squirrels, it's rabbits, it's everything. Right. And so in talking to him about that, I, I've i always been interested in trapping, even when I was a kid. I, I had a have, a have a heart trap from the time I was probably 10 years old, and I used to trap stuff in the yard all the time. And so I, I've been interested in trapping for a long period of time. I just never really gotten into it. And so uh, something I'm interested in learning a lot more about, and it is a piece of the puzzle for right. managing population managing. of our critters that we like, that we love, that we right. want to protect so we can kill more of. It's kind of a weird cycle, <laughs> isn't it? But we get it. Yeah. The non-hunters don't get it. So, yeah. Trent, I just want to thank you for coming on today to yeah. talk about some more advanced trap sets. We're going to get into some of that this evening. And thank you for taking time out. So tell us how are you and where are you? I am in Michigan, and first off, I would like to say thank you for having my wife and I down turkey hunting last spring. We had a really good time. Shoot, yeah. Um, turkey didn't cooperate, but, you know, it's, it's, it's hunting, it's not killing, and, and it's camaraderie, and That's right. we had good weather, and we had a great time. So That's I want right. to thank you for that. And uh, I am in Michigan, like I said, and um, I... I'm a carpenter by trade, but full-time trapper, you know, I, uh, I do nuisance control and I did fur trap full-time for oh, about five years, a couple of years ago uh, mm. when the fur market was stronger. And, you know, now I just kind of choose my battles, I guess, go out of state and, you know, go to places where I, you know, can make a dollar trapping. Right. Though, so, yeah. When did you first start trapping? I'm not exactly sure what age I was, but maybe 10 10 years old. Okay. And first animal I caught was a muskrat and a little marsh. A couple of my buddies had got traps, you know, and their grandpas, they had them hanging in the barn at their grandpa's dairy farm. And we had, there was a marsh down the road in a guy's front yard and we set some traps and that was the first muskrat I ever caught. And, you know, I found a couple other little marshes and we just happened to have little pothole marshes around here that have muskrats in them. So that was where we, you know, where I started and we have beavers and mm-hmm. had some beaver back then. And, and it kind of graduated to beavers and there wasn't a lot of raccoon back then there was more mink and you know mink got me interested and i used to do a lot of mink trapping and travel and and some of my buddies get a kick out of it when i first started seriously trapping in high school i actually you could get a a moped license at 13 years of age Mm -hmm. before you could get learner's permit at 15 years of age and i could drive on a road with a moped so i saved my fur money up and bought a honda spree i outfitted it with milk crate baskets on the sides and before school in the morning i would go out on my honda spree and i would run a long line for mink around my parents house loop a couple of sections and we happened to be along a, a good size 
creek that had a lot of feeder creeks that fed into it that was just loaded with mink back then. And That's awesome. Go out and get beaver and mink off of a off of a moped. That's <laughs> <So>. awesome. <laughs> I was pretty ate up with it back then. Yeah. That's awesome, yeah. man. That's a cool story. I, I I like that. Those stories of kids going hunting or in your case trapping before school or mm-hmm. after school. I mean, that's that's just yeah. awesome. I, I, and it suits me. It describes me, I should say, because it's really all I ever wanted to do. And still, mm-hmm. you know, when I'm sitting in the office, I don't want to be in the office. I'd rather be in the woods. Mm -hmm. So, you know, that's awesome. I love hearing that. It reminds me of, you know, a lot of people always ask me, as a professional fur trapper, the guys want to know how you catch lots of fur, volumes of fur, enough to make, to pay bills. And I look at it as I've been doing it working, you know, and I don't know many kids today that would get up at four o'clock in the morning and run a trap line for hours on a moped in the cold and wet and ice and snow prior to coming home, cleaning up and getting ready and going to school, Mm -hmm. you know, and that kind of work ethic has, has progressed into where I'm at today, what I do today. And if if you apply that into, you know, the way I apply it into my fur trapping today is just, just to keep pushing harder and harder. And a lot of guys wonder, wow, man, how do you, you know, catch all these numbers, thousands and thousands of muskrats or hundreds of coyotes or whatever. And it really just comes down to that. It comes down to getting up at four o'clock in the morning and being willing to work till midnight at night and work really hard at it. And, you know, you're going to be rewarded. That's, that's what I got out of that as, as a little kid, I guess, doing that running around on my moped when, you know, my other buddies were sleeping in and going to basketball practice and (laughs) doing different stuff, you know? Right. So, yeah. 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 So, I mean, you brought that up about, trapping fur for a living to pay bills Mm -hmm. i mean that's got to be tough that's that's not easy work no no it's you have to love it It, it's it's so hard i mean in to me it isn't because it's something that i absolutely love to do so it isn't work Mm -hmm. if i looked at it like work i would never do it there's no way you you uh, you just the, the amount of work for the amount of reward you know i have to make sure i had to know that we have a pretty solid fur market for one. I have a, I have a wife, a house, bills, you know, mm-hmm. payments, that kind of thing, taxes to pay. Sure. Um, you you got to make sure I, I need to catch X number of animals to make X amount of dollars. I got to have a fairly solid fur market knowing I'm going into the next couple of months. You know, if things are out of whack in any way or or there's any kind of, what do I want to say? Um, you know, if I'm talking to bigger fur buyers and, and they're unsure about the market, that's not a time to be in this market right. doing it full time. Do it yeah. part time. Do it, take, take your time. Go like I do now. Take a couple weeks. Go somewhere. If you break even, you break even. If you make $500, you make $500. You don't always have these big windfall times when muskrats are, you know, I mean, 10 to $17 and you go out and catch thousands of them and you make a lot of money at it. Um, mm-hmm. Those times come and go and you have to kind of understand as a trapper, at least I do, you know, when to do it. I know how many I can catch if I work this hard at a, at a minimum that covers bills. And I kind of have to understand that idea of it. You know, it's like the guys in Iowa that trap raccoons and have, you know, they know they can go catch a thousand raccoons in a, in a month or two. Well, if they're working hard for two months and to catch a thousand raccoons and they're $5 a piece, well, you know, yeah. they're going to be in a lot of ramen noodles yeah. you know, by the time they pay their gas bill and, and everything else. But if they're 15 or $18 a piece now, you know, and they're, they work a job where maybe they're doing flat work like concrete or, or construction where they're laid off or they're, they have time off anyway. Sure. You know, it, that's a good extra income. And that's really all, all I ever looked at it as is, is an extra income. I was, I'm still always a carpenter during the rest of the season. I don't do it 365 days a year. It's something to fill in the gaps. Uh, it would be a slower time of year or a time I would schedule off a month or two to do that work. But I knew that I could make as much as I made as a carpenter or more in that short period of time. So that's kind of how I look at it. And, you know, I still do today. It's just, I just don't, people ask, well, why aren't you trapping? And, well, <laughs> you know, there's the, yeah. the tax bills due at the end of the month, you know? That's right. So, yeah, you gotta, you gotta make sure those things are taken care of. So yeah, still economics yeah. when it all boils down to it. Yeah, sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Well, since you have come on the show the first time, I have mm-hmm. started doing what I call rapid fire Q and A. Okay. And if you are agreeable to play along, what I do is I will go through and ask 30 questions just related about turkeys and turkey hunting or related to turkeys and turkey hunting. 
And the goal of the 30 questions, first and foremost, is for us to kind of get to know you very quickly. And okay. there are questions that, that somebody would ask you if they were sitting around the campfire having a warm drink with you on a cold winter <laughs> night. Okay. Nothing scientific. And okay. so that's the first goal is to get to know you a little bit better. The second goal is to see if you can beat the fastest time out there. And the fastest <laughs> time is two minutes and five seconds. Ooh. Now, okay. there's an asterisk beside that fastest time. Okay. And that asterisk is this. Pete Muller has the fastest time, and he is the public relations specialist with the NWTF. And Pete okay. actually got to do this two days in a row because oh. our interview that we did on day one didn't record. So ah. I had to re-record the interview with him, and on day two, he broke the fastest time by three seconds. <laughs> okay. So the next fastest time, which is without practice, was two minutes and 8.96 seconds. So that's what you're gunning for. If you want to play along, I'm going to put get the stopwatch opened up here on my phone, and okay. we will roll with this thing. Okay. All right. So I'm going to start the clock as soon as I start the first question. And by the way, since you've not done this, pass is an acceptable answer. Is an acceptable answer. Okay. That's correct. But if you pass on okay. me 30 times, <laughs> <laughs> I'll have to settle up with you when we get to Nashville in a couple of weeks. <laughs> okay. <laughs> uh, you can't pass on me that many times. All right. How many full body turkey mounts do you own? Three. How many turkeys did you kill last season? One. Diaphragm, box, pot and peg, or wing bone? Diaphragm. Wild turkey, grilled, baked, or fried? Grilled. Wild turkey on the rocks, neat with cola or with water? On the rocks. Number of grand slams? Four. Make of your favorite turkey shotgun shell? Winchester. Make of your shotgun? Mossberg. Have you ever killed a bearded hen? No. Have you ever killed a Jake? Yes. Ten minutes successful hunt on a two year old bird or a four hour long hunt with a clean miss on a four year old bird? Four year old bird. Favorite camo pattern? Real tree. Wild turkey legs for dinner or for the dog? For the dog. More or less than five strikers in your turkey vest? One. Less. 30 mile per hour winds blowing at home the last day of turkey season. Are you hunting or sleeping in? I'm hunting. The state you killed your first turkey in? Michigan. The state you killed your last turkey in? Michigan. Sit in a blind for four hours and squeeze the trigger or run and gun for one hour and not shoot? Run and gun. Rios or Osceola's? Rios. Rios or Eastern's? Rios. Rios or Merriam's? Rios. Public land out west or private land in the southeast? Public land out west. Two and three quarter inch, three inch or three and a half inch shells? Three and a half. Four, five, six or blended shot? Six. Fields turkeys or woods turkeys? Fields. Pump or automatic? Pump. Shotgun scope, rifle sight, holographic sight or beads? Rifle sight. Rubber boots, leather boots or snake boots? Leather boots. You roost a bird this afternoon and it's pouring rain at daylight. Do you hunt in the morning? Yes. Favorite place you've ever hunted? Oh. Nebraska. Oh, man. <laughs> I stumped you on two questions. You, I got pauses out of you on two questions. I have two uh, minutes, two minutes and sixteen point three three seconds. Uh, <laughs> the last one got me good. Yeah, I, got I had couple, to think about that one. <laughs> I got a couple, two or three seconds on you out of that last one. Yeah, and, uh, and you know it's hard. It's hard for somebody that, and I'm not going to say you don't BS because when when we're sitting around having an adult beverage, you can BS with the best of them. But when you have somebody who wants to give good solid answers to these questions that question right there will make you stop and think if you've been yeah. hunting more than just a few you know a handful of places so right I, i'm gonna say this just because your time is so good i don't think you need to be told anything so that you'll feel better but you smoked <laughs> my time ah. <laughs> okay <laughs> <laughs> so uh, very good that's probably fourth or fifth best okay okay yeah, very good time so all right and you know like i said the the prize for this is we get to know you a little bit better <laughs> there you go <laughs> so good deal well let's let's talk about trapping some critters okay and i told you this on the phone the other day i've gotten some dog proof coon traps and right i put them out in the backyard just because mm -hmm. it's something to do i mean you're hunting when you're not hunting how sure, fun can that sure. be so i get these traps set get them wired to a couple of saplings in the backyard bait them go back inside you 
you know, I'm, I'm like a kid on Christmas Eve in bed that night, tossing and turning, all excited. I keep wanting to peek out the window and see if there's anything in the trap, but I, I stop from doing all that. Get up the next morning, go outside, and both traps are gone. Mm-hmm. The Cardinal wire, sin. the trap, everything mm-hmm. gone. Yeah. So I couldn't help but laugh. You know, I, I hate, I seriously, yeah. I don't, I don't like for any animal to suffer, even if it's a predator. But mm-hmm. I couldn't help but laugh to think that there's either two raccoons walking around the woods with a <laughs> dog-proof mm-hmm. trap on either front leg, or there's one raccoon running around the woods with two dog-proof <laughs> coons. <laughs> <laughs> it's very possible <laughs> yeah yeah and so uh, i've walked around in the woods in the backyard a little bit and i, mm-hmm. I haven't found them you know they're painted uh, yeah. a green color and shoot you'd have to trip yeah. over it to to find yep. it so i got me four more i've been trapping a few coons in the backyard and I'm probably getting close to that point where I'm starting to get them educated a little bit. So we're going to talk about some advanced trap sets for turkey predators. Mm -hmm. We want to get not only the stupid ones, but we want to get the smart ones as well. So my first question to you is this. You've got a lot of experience trapping. Mm -hmm. You have a lot of experience turkey hunting as well. I know you're not a turkey Mm -hmm. biologist, but in your Mm -hmm. opinion, what do you think is the number one predator for wild turkeys, whether it's in the mm-hmm. nest or if we're talking about mature birds? Yeah. Or even pups? Um, yeah. So my, my uh, first, I would like to go back to your DP in the backyard scenario and, and say to everybody out there, Andy broke the cardinal rule of trapping. Do not anchor with wire. Again, do not anchor with wire. Do not anchor with wire. Don't anchor your trap with wire. So when you, obviously you can break wire, kinking it back and forth and it can break a raccoon struggles with the trap, pulls and uses brute force. And he's going to do that back and forth consistently over the time. He's going to snap your wire. So Mm -hmm. cable, rebar, chain, but you know, yeah. Okay. Then there, and it kind of leads into that question. I've done a lot of seminars, uh, wild wild turkey workshops here for our, uh, for National Wild Turkey Federation, our local chapter, Mm -hmm. Um, done our workshops. And so through that, and talking to groups around our state and other places, I did a lot of research to find out what are our predators as a trapper? What are the turkey predators? And what I found from research from uh, universities in Texas, universities in Alabama, and uh, other other places is that they found that raccoons actually move their their local, you know, their their travel routes during nesting season to nesting cover because of their success as nest predators. So wow. now they're not killing adults, but they're actually moving. The radio collar raccoons that they had were actually moving into nesting areas because of, of ground nesting birds, wow. whether it be quail That's... or pheasant or turkey or any of these. And even small songbirds climb, you know, and a small sapling raccoon can climb up there really easily and eat eggs. Usually that time of year, you're going to start having, you know, some frogs, some insects coming along, which will kind of get them off the eggs. But that initial, the first few hatches that happen early, you're going to nest predators and raccoons are the ones that they really stressed in the studies that I read were the were the big ones. Obviously, there's going to be skunks and, and possums also, but raccoons mm-hmm. are the are the are the nest predators they're killing you know i i believe the bulk of the turkeys even more than the you know when it comes to poults or or adults so okay all right that's what i've read as well is that the raccoon is probably the number one predator mm-hmm. on turkeys because they'll i mean what you think about it once you find a nest there's 10 or 12 eggs in there well shoot, mm-hmm. that's a lot of damage Right nest, and once they, I yeah. think once they find a nest, they're looking for more nests. Absolutely. So absolutely. So let's start with the mm-hmm. raccoon then. Okay. Walk me through exactly how you're going to set your traps. I mean, I know there are a bunch of different yeah. traps out there that we can use. But so I would say, sure. you know, let's let's talk about some dog proof, but as uh, you know, the other yeah. squeeze hole traps, whatever whatever other traps you're going to yeah. use, and yeah, let's talk about where you're going to where you're going to set these traps. Right, right. Now, so starting out, if I were to go into a property to to control a raccoon population, like in a you know a, a managed property, the first thing I'm going to do is find out if they have feeders. It depends on the time of year. A lot of times they want me in there in the fall during the fur season, if you know, or whatever, or sometimes in the spring um, prior to nesting. Uh, again, they're usually feeding. They usually have feeders around, and 
that's that's where I would start. If if this property that I'm setting on has deer feeders, it's running protein feeder corn or whatever they're feeding, that's the first place I'm going to go. A lot of times they'll run trail cameras around those. Those are real real important tools to know to talk to the landowner about the trail cameras and how many raccoons are seen on what feeders. And then I always the first thing I always think about is way overset the amount of traps for the number of raccoons. Once they start to see their buddies caught in traps, they're going to start avoiding the area. And so if if I know there's eight raccoons coming to this feeder, I'm putting at least 12 traps there. Usually what I'll do is I'll start at the feeder itself. And I will set DPs, dog-proof traps, around the feeder itself mm-hmm. with one basic, simple kind of bait. Either some, you know, manufactured bait. I, you know, made a bait for years. I, I have sent, sold that to St- Keith Winkler, Sterling Fur. He still sells truckload coon bait. And then, you know, there's a lot of other things. You can use cat food and barbecue sauce and honey. And there's all the different kinds of guys making different mixtures up that things that you can use sweet type baits usually seem to work the best to start with. That's what I usually would start with. Okay. And then I'm going to look for all the trails leading into after I got my DP set around the feeder, I'm going to look at all the trails leading into the feeder. Mm-hmm. And then I'm going to use a, a body grip trap or a 220 counter bear. Yeah. If now some States you can't use a 220 on dry land, you have to use a 160 or 150 which when I say a 220, that's a seven by seven. You go down to a six by six or a five by five, depending on the, some states have different laws. That's, that's the, the jaw size, hinge to hinge or jaw, you know, however that state decides to allow you to use, you know, what size of trap it allows you to use. Okay. Um, and I'll use those. One thing with that trap, when you set a, a body grip trap in a raccoon trail, you want to try to keep it at head height. You don't want the raccoon to, to have to duck too much into the trap. So you want to hold it, you know, four or five inches off of the ground. I use a stabilizer type support for my body grip trap, which what it is is a piece of rebar with a, some wire tabs on the top that fit the that I fit the trap into. It also works as my anchor system, so it actually holds the trap in place. So okay. it, it ties off my trap plus it it anchors my trap, and I can run it in. So it's four or five inches out of the ground, secure my trap to that. And then when a raccoon's walking down the trail, he's actually seeing straight through the trap instead of having a duck down to go through it if you put it flat on the ground. Gotcha. And I would just, depending on where you are in the country, the size of your raccoon, just think about how long a raccoon's legs are. That's where, you know, you want your trap, bottom jaw of your trap to be about a little lower than the chest of that raccoon as he's walking. That's what I would think about. Um, The other thing is they're really good climbers and they like to climb over those traps. So you want to always try to block it down from the top if possible. The sides, usually they're going to shoot straight down the trail. The sides are important, but not as important as the top. They'll go over a 220 or a 160 or a a conibar in a trail like it isn't even there if you don't block the top down and make them go through it because it doesn't seem like a big enough opening for them, especially the smaller traps like the 160s and the the, the smaller sizes. Yeah, and Um, you're blocking that with tree branches or something Exactly. Okay. Yep, yep. Uh, I I prefer, I mean, if I have it around, I prefer like cedar boughs, you know, thicker green, or if there's a thicker like tan, like foxtail, I don't know, um, different types of weeds that grow that are kind of fluffy type weeds to make mm-hmm. it really almost like a solid wall above the trap and a hole through the center. Okay. So you're trying to get them to kind of shoot through that hole. Okay. So all right. those would be the two things that I would start with. Now, I don't know if you want me to, I, I worked on a property. I have a good friend of mine that lives actually the South of me, but he has a, pro, a, a hunting property North of me. He's a retired NFL player, and he's been wanting me to come up there and catch his raccoons off his feeders for years. So we went up there this year, and I started in on him, and he has a pile of raccoons. He's on a major river between two parks that are no hunting, and uh, just lo- places just loaded with game. And um, there are a lot of turkeys. And I mean, mm-hmm. it's the, you got to get the coon, raccoon population down because they're really going to, you know, take a, a toll on the nest predators in there. And um, so I went in there and I set all his feeders up. I believe there was four or five feeders that we set up. And I started right off the bat. Every feeder was catching, you know, quadruples and six raccoons in my 220s around them and in in the DPs around. And every day I'm catching raccoons and possums and skunks around around these feeders. Well, it started dwindling down as I'm there and um, he hadn't been there during the week and it was the week prior to gun season. And he wanted me to pull prior to the, you know, his guys coming into camp for gun right. season, for deer, deer season. So he came through and I was pulling traps and he went down to prepare a blind down by the river. Well, I was making my loop coming around. And as I came up to him, he's laughing at me 
because he said, you know, that feeder right up there in front, you didn't have a single raccoon at it. And, you know, that's the feeder by the house. We run year round, 365 days. It has, it has some type of feed coming out of it. Mm -hmm. And he said, you had six traps, you know, around that feeder. And I had off the east and west side of that feeder, I had 220. So I had 10 traps around that feeder. He said, last night on my trail camera, there were 10 raccoons under that feeder and you never caught one of them. Wow. Yeah. So that shows you the importance of trail cameras. And I kind of looked at him and his son was laughing at me and <laughs> they were just kind of, jo you know, joking about it. But I thought, yeah. wow, you know, and I, and I had caught, you know, 20 raccoons off that feeder already. And there yeah. were 10 that night under there and I had not caught a one. So now we were pulling that day. But if knowing that information, obviously the traps, I wasn't moving my traps around mm -hmm. much. But what I really would do in a situation like that, if I was staying there and I was going to continue trapping that location. Now we can't, if, if I could legally set snares for raccoons, which I can't in Michigan, that's what I would have went to next. If I was in a place where I could snare the raccoons by using a cable mm -hmm. snare, mm -hmm. that's the next step I would have went to. If it was legal, I would have snared the raccoons on the trails farther down. They're, they're a lot more, a lot less intrusive to the trail. You know, it's just a, a thin piece of cable. Um, they're very effective. A raccoon, you hardly have to block them down. The raccoons will just walk right into it. That would be my next thing. But in this case, I couldn't, you know, I couldn't do that because in Michigan, we can't use snares for raccoons. So I would have actually started to backtrack off of the feeder. And then the other thing I would have done would be take whatever he, because he was using shelled corn in the feeder and I was using different food in my DPs. Yeah. Is I would have taken my DPs, got them closer to the feeder, capped off the feeder, taken corn from the feeder and put it in my DPs with something else in it and maybe put my DPs on sliders so I wouldn't damage his feeder and get the raccoons out and away from his feeder. I want to set him far enough away. Obviously, if, he's, if the raccoon, if the leg of the feeder is in the catch circle, I don't want to damage his feeder. So right. if I wanted to set my trap right under the feeder where the raccoons were eating, I could, but what I'm going to do is I'm going to anchor the trap there on a slide cable and, and then pull it once the raccoon gets caught. He can slide out away from the feeder and be held out and away from the feeder so he doesn't damage the feeder. So okay. that's a couple of tricks you can you can do to you know catch these raccoons at the feeder but one of the big things is i think they have that you know corn on their mind when they're walking in there and if i'm using truckload or and i went through three different types of baits that week at that feeder changing up different things but i never did use corn mm -hmm. and so i'm thinking if i would have went to corn that would have been a, a change up because they're, they're actually going there looking for corn um, the other thing would be is actually maybe take some more DPs down the trails farther back in into the into the woods away from the feeder, you know, and catch and catch them as they came into the feeders. Yeah. So, you know, just a couple of advanced things you could do if you're trapping around feeders like that. The other thing that I do here is we have the some people would consider it a positive, some people a negative, but snow where I can actually track the raccoons. And if I can track them back to a den, that would be another thing I could do is I could track them to a den. We didn't in October, but you could track the trails back and set the traps back on the trails farther away from the feeder, catch them coming into the feeder, um, make more blind sets with 220s back farther away from the feeder so they're not as aware that that trap uh, close to the feeder caught an animal that smell from that raccoon that had already been caught there was there directly you know i could just constantly bounce my back my traps off from the feeder to continue picking up those raccoons especially in an area like that where we you know there were hundreds of raccoons there that that needed to be removed yeah so i guess question from a beginner or rookie trapper mm -hmm. and remember if we get snow in alabama <laughs> right. we're not yeah. thinking about trapping we're thinking about surviving with you know a quarter inch of snow on the ground and so right. we've raided the grocery store of milk and bread so we can make milk sandwiches or bread cereal i'm not sure what we make with all that personally i head to the liquor store but that's different <laughs> different story for a different episode so how are we how are you identifying coon trails? I mean, the obvious thing is to say, okay, well, you're going to look for tracks in the mud, but right, if right, there's right. a bunch of leaves on the ground, how are you identifying coon trails? Yeah, in, in, in this case where I was there, when I was young, before I really understood what a raccoon trail was, there's such a creature, a habit a raccoon is, food to, food to bed, den, den to food, that they'll actually beat a trail down up a fence row, you know, and, and, a, and, and a lot of the other animals are secondary users of the raccoon's trail. So it'll look like a small game trail, just a, pat, a beat down path. 
Okay. But the majority of the animals that are making those, it's actually the raccoon because they have they have found something, an apple tree, uh, persimmons, whatever it may be, and they're and they're they have used that path back and forth to that particular food source. Now that food source may dry up and that that path may go dead, but when it fruits again, they're going to use that same path again to get back and forth to that food source. You know, I learned this when I was younger from hound hunters, dog hunters that I you know kind of learn cut my teeth with when I was young learning that type of sign, you know, and understanding what those trails were, those paths were in the woods were, you know, from the raccoons. And so it it, it really, without showing you a picture of one, it, it looks like a, a, a matted down path um, to distinguish it from what you would say a deer trail. You know, it almost looks similar to a deer trail, except for obviously a raccoon is at the most 30 inches tall, you know, mm-hmm. 20 inches tall. Um, if he goes into a fence row, he's going to have a tunnel going into the fence row. Right. If your path goes in there, it's going to be six, you know, five foot tall. It's going to pe- push a path through there. Yeah. And a lot of times raccoons will use deer runs, you know, where, and if they are, all I'm doing is making sure I extra block my trap down to make the deer step over it and the raccoon to go through, mm-hmm. you know, but there's a lot of times when I'll catch them right on, you know, right on a deer run or the deer and the raccoons are using the same run, you know, leading into the feeder. Um, okay. But it looks like a, you know, a small padded down path. You know, you can usually see, you know, mud in the grass from their footprints where they're walking in the clay or the mud. Right. And yeah. track it up into the grass. So they've smeared the grass with mud in those areas and they packed it down from just months of use. Repeatedly using it. Yeah. Okay. Right, right, right. Okay. Mm-hmm. All right. And then my other follow-up question for you is you mentioned that if you were not pulling out of that trap side over at your buddy's place that you yeah. would probably use some corn for bait in those dog proof traps and put something with yeah. it. What would you put with the corn in those traps? Um, in, I prefer sweet type, you know, bait. Okay. The, so, you a, know, a there's, the, and, and there's, yes, there's okay. commercially, there's commercially available liquid additives to that you could add to corn and I, I I would probably lean toward those, especially in the South, because of the ants. Um, if you go out and you start using honey, grape jelly, which are great and fine baits, but there's no preservatives in them. Mm-hmm. And with no preservatives, they're going to start to spoil pretty quickly, mold um, in, in heat, in the humidity. Um, where us in the first season here, or later in the fall, a lot of times when I'm trapping the raccoons, we have a cold enough temperatures where that stuff isn't going to spoil. But it, there's no reason, if you knew you were going to catch a raccoon in the first night or two, to use a barbecue sauce from the dollar store or to get some jelly or to use some, you know, corn syrup or whatever you have available that, you know, is, is easy and inexpensive. But yeah. there are commercially available liquid type baits that you can purchase. Minnesota Trap Line products, Sterling Fur, places like that. If you go online, look on their websites, there's a lot of different type of persimmon, choke cherry, whatever's native to your area that would be natural to the raccoon that you could use. A lot of different types of raccoon, commercially available raccoon lures. What are nice about those is I can take it, throw it in my truck, throw it in my bag. Don't worry about it because it's not going to spoil. Next mm-hmm. year, when I take it out of my bag, it's just going to work the same as it did the year before. Okay. Because these lure makers have, have preserved it in a way that it's not going to spoil on you. Like once you open a jar of, you know, human potable food, it's going to start to go bad on you pretty quickly. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the problems I always have with putting human food in, in any kind of trap, you know, whether I'm trapping squirrels or chipmunks or whatever, is I always end up eating it before it gets in the trap. So <laughs> that's right. an issue. Yeah. So yeah, I've, yeah. I've been using dog food in those dog proof traps because okay. when I was using marshmallows in there, I was actually getting my tongue stuck in the trap, <laughs> trying to get the marshmallow out. So, right, right. Yeah, and that hurts. Yep. And I'm, I'm a big proponent of that. I have a video out that I show using a, a marshmallow on the trigger. It gives the raccoon something to grab a hold of when they're mm-hmm. to fire the trap. Um, on the DPs that I use, I like a pole style trigger. Um, you right. cut down on incidentals, you know, if a deer were to stick its tongue in there and lick and it doesn't, it wouldn't fire or a fox or something like that. You're only going to catch the animals that have a, a, you know, a paw that can grab whatever's on the trigger and pull. If it's a push pull trigger, you're going to catch a couple more incidentals that way, maybe a house cat or something like that. Yeah. So. Okay. All right. So let's talk a little bit about some of the other predators. I mean, that that would be a, a pretty good start with the coons. And you told us mm-hmm. kind of a, what you would do in that situation at your buddy's place where if you weren't 
having to pull out. You told us kind of what you would do to, to ramp up your efforts there and, and trap some of those right. more educated birds, or I was about to say birds, some of those more <laughs> educated raccoons. So right. let's talk about some of the other critters. Are you going to do anything different for possums than you are raccoons, or is it going to be pretty much the same type trap set in the same location? Pretty much the same, uh, except if you wanted to target specifically possums, go to more of a, a, a rotten, stinkier bait. You're going to catch more possums that way. If you're going to use your okay. uh, body grip traps for those, lower them to the ground a little more. Obviously, they're shorter-legged. Mm. You know, those would be things that if I was going to target possums, and I was in an area where I knew I had, you know, a lot of possums, but I have no no problem catching lots of possums in my raccoon sets. So right. really, I'm going to catch them. You're, you're catching them anyway. I mean, there's lots of times when you're you're catching, you know, you're going to catch the possums. You know, it just kind of comes along with the, the territory. And, and not to say that using, you know, a fish bait doesn't work great because that's another thing that I go to a little bit later in the year. And if you want to change up uh, like a fish paste bait, Jack mackerel is a good one. You can add a preservative to Jack mackerel and make your own bait, you know, just some Jack mackerel some sugar in a uh, mixed type of preservative. There's methylparaben, there's sodium benzoate you can mix with it that you can buy easily available at any trap and supply. And the ratios will be easily found online to make your own bait and use a fish type paste bait. That's a lot of guys, will, and there's a lot of manufacturers that sell fish type paste bait. And if you want to use it, use that for a change up, that would be another good change up you could use in your, in your DP traps. Okay. All right. Mm-hmm. So what about skunks? I mean, that's that's a critter I really don't know much about other than the fact that when I drive by one that's been hit on the highway, it smells a mile in whatever the downwind direction is from the, from the skunk. Right, right. But as far as, I, I think in all of my years of hunting and all of the places that I have hunted, I have seen one live skunk in the woods. Huh. I, we just, they're so nocturnal in Alabama right. that we just don't see very many of them and while we're hunting or out in the woods messing around and mm-hmm. I don't think we have the population of skunks here that maybe you guys have up north. Yeah. And they're in pockets. I mean, there's places definitely in Michigan even in in even in the west that there's certain areas that have more skunks than than others and in even here locally we don't have a lot of skunks where I live. You know, if if I'm predator trap and if i catch one a year that's a lot of skunks okay. and uh that but i know guys in the western end of the upper peninsula in northern wisconsin there's a lot of skunks there i mean they catch a lot of skunks and then guys in that trap in kansas they catch a lot of skunks you know for the the trapper that knows what he's doing with a skunk they're a pretty valuable animal the fur is fairly valuable the essence is very valuable sold by the ounce used in predator baits there's a shortage of it in the market right now so the price per ounce is is pretty high um, they can be one of the most valuable animals on the on the line in in off fur years mm. um, if you know how to extract the essence um, but for guys that just want to get rid of them as a nest predator one of the big things for a, a skunk is is they're most i mean they'll, they'll eat garbage and they'll eat you know i catch them in my dp traps i don't catch them as much in my dp traps if i use sweet baits and if i went to fish baits base stuff i would catch more but they're an insect eater they eat a lot of insects okay i mean they're an opportunist so if they find a nest they're gonna you know they're gonna get into a nest but they are you know they get eating grubs and worms and 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 that kind of thing golf courses have major problems with them grubbing in fairways and Mm -hmm. they can make they can cause a lot of damage fast and the good adc guys that i know usually use some type of a grub paste bait some type of an insect based type of a product to catch skunks you know with consistency i would say okay all right are there any kind of different tactics that you would use to actually, I mean, where, where would you set traps for skunks? Cause it's just kind of seems like it's a random, they're yeah. traveling randomly around through the woods and that kind of thing. But maybe they do live in brush piles, live in culverts, they live in bulldoze piles, that kind of thing. And they're, and they're where you see sign, you're going to catch skunks usually. That's, that's the okay. big thing for me is, you know, if I, if I'm in an area where somebody's seen them regularly in their yard or they're on a golf course where they're calling me in to do ADC work, that's, you know, I know I'm catching skunks, I'm seeing skunk sign. You know, they are where they are generally. Um, they usually have to have some type of fairly, you know, thick cover to hide in to weather out the, the uh, daytime, you know, mm-hmm. to, to hide. But for the most part, they're 
edges of fields where you would canine trap. You know, a lot of times I'll try to sit off of the edge so I don't catch the skunks and possums, let the, ki- the canines use their nose to find my sets. If I happen to be right on the edge, I'm going to catch more possums and skunks, but it may be the best location, so I'd set there anyway, and then just back it up with another set in a field. Okay. You know, maybe farther out in the in the open. Yeah. Okay. All right. That's good info. I still don't think I'm going to set a trap for a skunk, but <laughs> I saw, speaking of skunks, and you may have seen this on social media, but I saw a picture on Twitter that somebody had taken of a skunk that he had caught in a have a heart trap in his garage of his house. Okay. And so the question that was posed along with this picture was, okay, what do I do now? <laughs> because Co- you know, cover, cover him up with a tarp and drag him outside. Yeah. If I mean, he hasn't you, sprayed already. Yeah. Yeah. You walk in there and you know, he's going to spray. So yeah, if it, you're most of the time, if you're not aggressive with them, they're pretty docile critters. You know, if you're not moving quickly, jerky around them, and you move fairly slowly and talk softly, and I don't know if the talk softly part helps, but I usually do it when I'm walking up to a skunk in a set, and I use an injection pole to put, you know, you know, what do you call it, uh, euthanasia fluid into their into their lungs to pet to make them pass out, so I can collect the essence. Oh. Um, you know, I walk up there with a pole that's not even six foot long with a syringe on the end. And I get within six foot of that skunk and I take a pole and I stick it in his lungs and, you know, gently push on his lungs and he just falls over, passes out. I don't want him to spray because the essence to me is, is, is uh, valuable. So if you're going to do the same thing, he's, he's in a cage trap and you, you walk up to him with a tarp or something, the sheet that keep you keep between him and the cage and you go really slowly, gradually walk up to the cage, gently lay the tarp over the cage and be very don't make any quick sudden moves Mm -hmm. take the cage up and walk them outside you know i've taken them off from from places in a trap and put them in the back of my truck and brought them home and had them sitting out inside of my shop for half a day before i you know anesthetize the skunk or put them down and then collect the essence from them on a job he never sprayed he's he's taking a ride half an hour ride and been sitting outside of my house wow. for half the day and they don't spray so it, people think that they're just going to initially spray but they're only doing that as a, a reaction to a threat you know so if you if you don't come off pose a big you know immediate threat to them they're not going to just hike the tail up and spray at you okay so you need to be a lot like a ninja when you're dealing with a skunk there, there you go <laughs> the yeah. skunk ninja yeah. uh-huh. that's right <laughs> that's how i want to start living my life <laughs> <I'm> the skunk <laughs> the skunk ninja <laughs> I hope that you guys enjoyed the first half of the interview and that this interview will get more of you guys motivated to get out there and do some trapping while you still have time. And I know from the survey that I had you guys fill out that about half of you hunt public land, whether it's state land or federal land. And there are many states that still allow trapping on public land. So those of you who do hunt public land can get out there and get rid of some of the predators on your public land spots. Who knows, maybe that one turkey nest that does not get destroyed means one more gobbling two-year-old in a couple of years. Just be sure that you know your state game laws, whether you're trapping on public or private land, and be sure to follow those. And now, if you guys were raised to never kill anything that you don't eat, then I want to point out that, and don't balk on me here, don't let me lose you here, but I want to point out that there are many raccoon and bobcat recipes online. Personally, I have never had either, but from what I understand from some people who have had it, Trent being one of them, is that bobcat meat is really good. If it makes you feel better to remove that animal from the population and you're not going to eat any of the meat, then skin it out and sell the hide. With some practice, you can get really quick at skinning out an animal. I've probably cleaned 400 plus deer in my lifetime. And no, I've never worked at a deer processing plant. But I can skin and quarter a deer out in about 10 minutes with a sharp knife and not even trying to go fast just my normal speed. So if you get some practice skinning these predators out, you can do it pretty quickly. You can dry those hides and you can sell them. And in times like right now when fur prices are low, your main goal should be 
removing these predators to help improve the population of all of the game species on your property. And if you can sell some hides and make enough money to buy more traps or more bait or more gasoline to get you back to the woods to run trap lines, then everyone wins. Well, except the predators. But the turkeys will win and all the other game animals will win as well. Okay, so part two of the interview will post next week and you definitely want to tune into that one as we focus on dispatching predators. Also next week, I'm going to share something that I stumbled across on YouTube that may help to get rid of a nest predator of wild turkeys that is rarely talked about. And Trent and I did not even cover it in our interview. All right, so before I cut you loose, I want to read a couple of reviews. Like I said, I'm behind on reviews, so I want to catch up a little bit before season starts and reviews really start to pour in here. So Dalton P. left a five-star rating and a review, and it says, Turkeys 3, me 0. I love the podcast. I've been public land turkey hunting for the last three years in Utah to no avail. I think even God is getting tired of hearing me pray for a gobbler to come into range. With these tips, maybe even I can finally get it done. Two weeks left in the season, I'll post back if I ever kill one. Dalton Pigman. Dalton, I don't think I've seen another review or another post here where you actually did kill one. I hope that you got the deal done last season. If not, this season's coming up quickly for you guys, and hopefully you've got a limited entry or a limited draw turkey tag to start hunting in April, and maybe you can make some magic happen then. The next review, Vince1230, left a five-star rating, and he says, Great podcast. I always learn something every week, which makes me always want to tune in. Being a self-taught, late-blooming turkey hunter, the show and guests have taught me a lot. Keep up the good work. Thank you, Vince. Thank you, Dalton. I greatly appreciate your reviews. As I've mentioned before, it helps people who stumble across the show to decide whether or not they want to tune in for an episode. Okay, so you guys know that I'm going to ask you for a favor this week. I ask you for one every single week, but this week I'm asking you for one ginormous favor. And that favor is this. If you will be attending the NWTF convention in Nashville, in a couple of weeks. I would greatly appreciate you going up to some of the people who have been on this show when you see them. People like Brenda Valentine, Mitchell Johnston, Preston Pittman, Chris Parrish, Eddie Salter, Jimmy Primos, Cuz Strickland, Trent Masterson, Tom Kelly, Harold Knight, and any of the other guests who have been on the show that I've left off. And there are a lot of them. And there are a lot of them who will be at the convention. So when you see those people, if you will go up to them and thank them for coming on to the Turkey Hunter podcast and for sharing information with all of us, that will be very much appreciated by me. It is good for these people who come on the show to know that you are out there and you're listening and you are a real person. Not only that, but you're a real person who spends money to help support their company and to support their sport. All of that matters, and it helps me to be able to get them back on the show to pick their brain a little bit more for more information. That, you got it, will help us all be better turkey hunters. All right, part two of the John Normus favor. I guess you could really say it's two favors, but I'm just going to call it one John Normus favor, part one and part two. If and when you see someone at the convention that you would like to hear me interview on this show, ask them why they haven't come on the Turkey Hunter podcast yet. Tell them about the show. Tell them that you listen and that you would love to hear them on this show. Tell them that everybody who is anybody is listening to this show and that you know I'd love to interview them for an episode. Okay, so I'm going to go ahead and throw this in there. I'm going to make this part three of the John Ormus favor. If you're going to the convention in Nashville, please don't forget to hit me up. Email me at andy at imturkeyhunting.com or DM me on Twitter. I will not be on Facebook while I'm there. 
So if you message me on Facebook, there is a 99.999% chance I will not get your message until the convention is over. So Twitter, you can either tag me in a tweet or DM me or send me an email. Andy at IamTurkeyHunting.com. I would love to meet you. I'd love to shake your hand and personally thank you for listening to this show. All right, so that's all I've got for you guys this week. Thank you so much for tuning in this week. I know that you have choices. I appreciate you spending your time with us. I hope you have a wonderful week, and I look forward to seeing you again next week. Goodbye. Thanks for tuning in. You were just listening to the Turkey Hunter podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please go on over to iTunes and leave a five-star review. And make sure to head over to www.iamturkeyhunting.com to subscribe for free turkey hunting tips, tactics, strategies, and product reviews to help you have a more successful turkey season. And stay tuned for upcoming episodes on hunting afternoon birds, how to film your hunt, and the breeding cycle of hens, as well as some guest interviews. Thanks again for listening. We know your time is valuable, and we appreciate you sharing some of it with us. See you next week.